This lecture you should only watch when you have solved the exercise sheet 4, which is looking a lot into this. So we're going to cover some of the things that are asked on that exercise sheet. So um, if you're following along, do the exercise sheet six, uh, 4 now and then come back to this video. Well, let's assume this magically happened in the meantime. So the topic of this lecture is block ciphers. So block ciphers, as opposed to stream ciphers, encrypt blocks of messages. Who would have guessed by that name? So here's a definition of what a block cipher does. Namely, it takes um, n bits of a message and produces n bits of encryption using a key of some length l. So l is the key length, and that might be equal to the block size, or it might be a different number. And so we're going to denote the encryption under this key k by n subscript k of this message. And for block service, we actually also have a decryption function, which is the inverse of the encryption function. Now that's not different from how the stream cipher is working. There we also encrypted by XORing, which was invertible. But for block cipher, we typically expect some more involved version of what happens with the bits that come in as input. In particular, Shen in the 1940s de um, developed two design goals, and he said that he wants to have the following happen. He wants to have confusion, which is not the same that he's trying to get with students. But also, the students we're trying to get confusion, we're actually trying to solve confusion. Now, with the block cipher, confusion means that the bits that are come in get mixed. So you're seeing like bits which are on the left get moved to the right and move from the right to the middle and so on. And diffusion. So if you have small differences in your input, like you're having two input messages which only differ in one bit, then their output ciphertexts should be very, very different. So differences should spread out. And he wants to have this happen with any cipher. And so block ciphers have the benefit that you have kind of a short piece that you can study well, but do note that again this n is going to be so large that you can't, well, just try all possible n bit to n bit maps because that is also going to be the security level. But still, you're getting a concrete, compact thing that you can study. If you have messages that are longer than one block, then you need to split these into blocks. So that's similar to what you've seen with max. That's similar to what you've seen with hash functions. But very important, um, you must ensure that you don't just encrypt these pieces blockwise. Because if you're doing that, then let's see what happens. Well, what could possibly have been the image that led to the ciphertext? Right? So the problem is if you're encrypting each piece, each pixel, the same way, then pixels that have the same color, say the, the belly of the penguin that was white before, and all of those white pixels now get turned into the same slightly purplish color. The black other parts turn into something which on this picture happened to be some sort of lighter black, and you still see all the contours. So everything we've done in the Caesar or substitution cipher analysis, namely to throw a frequency analysis on it, will still hold with this one. Of course, you have a much bigger code book, but each time you're looking up the same plain text, you're getting the same cipher text. So each time you're looking up a white pixel, you're getting the same color pixel back. And so do remember this ECB penguin ECB stands for electron, electronic code book. Remember this as a warning not to use this mode. So the video modes of operation is covering better ways of how to take these blocks and chain them with one another so that this issue doesn't appear. Similar to hash functions, similar to max, also here you need to deal with padding issues. So if your message doesn't have to be, that doesn't happen to be a multiple of n, then the last few bits Will be filled with padding, and then each um, cipher or padding, uh, each mode of operation will specify a padding scheme. Now let's look at one very famous case, namely uh, the Feistel network. So Feistel um, was a researcher in the 1950s and 70s. He worked for IBM after working for the U.S. government, and he designed what is now known as the Feistel network. So this is. Um, something that happens inside the block cipher. So you're getting in n bits, and at the bottom you're getting out n bits again. 
And then in between, there are these functions f by taking the right side input, uh, right half as input, and adding it to the left half. And these functions f1 till, in this case, just f4, um, they are also using parts of the secret key. So these functions will typically have a very similar way how they're built, how they're wired, but there are some pieces where the key comes in. We typically want to have an even number of rounds so that each half gets handled equally often. So at the beginning, you have the left and the right here, and then the rolls swap and swap and swap and swap again. And each time you actually encrypting something on the left side. So here you're having the XOR come in, which does a stream encryption or similar to what we're saying, stream cipher encryption of the left hand side with something depending on the right hand side. And so Faisal and IBM had this in a design called Lucifer, which they submitted for standardization by the US government when in the late 70s, the US government was looking for a cipher. Now, much to their surprise, the US government actually published that design and um, well, did a few changes that we'll get into, but that's also was a huge boost to the public analysis of cryptography, both the symmetric side and then soon after was also the mention of uh, public key cryptography, so that's all is mid to late 70s when this design came out. Now there is a nice feature of this design when you look at it. Namely, this function f in the middle doesn't need to be invertible. We mean that the whole thing is invertible, but these fi can be one-way functions. They don't even have to take the same number of bits, well, okay, for an x, or you need to have something which is matching the length there, but you could have the R, the right side, the left hand side, from the left hand side, and so on. The reason that we can still decrypt is, well, let's trace these errors from the bottom up. And in particular, the L sub 4, well, just a moment ago, this was the R sub 3. And nothing happened at that step. So L sub 4 is the same as L sub 3. And the L sub 3, that has been XOR with something, ah, okay, that was computed using the F4 on R3. Now R3 we know because it's the same as L4, and so we can actually compute L3 as well. And then we swap the roles, and we know R2 now because it's the same as L3, which we just computed, and therefore we can compute L2. And eventually we're getting back to L0 and R0. So because this fi don't have to be invertible, we're having a lot of flexibility in how to build this. Now, sticking with the famous example of this, this has its file network structure, but instead of having four rounds, it has 16 rounds. And there is also some extra stuff at the beginning happening. So when you have your um, input bits, in that case are 64, they first run through some permutation before they get split up into these parts. And also at the end, there's another permutation, which is the inverse of the permutation above there, which then um, again shuffles those 64 bits. And of course, then there is a key schedule, which is taking the key. In this case, those are 64 bits, of which 56 are effective, and those feed into these functions. Now, on the next slide, I have one of those functions in detail. And well, just rotate this by 90 degrees. Um, so we're having the right hand side come in from the top now, so those are the 32 bits, so half of 64. And what happens first to them is that those six, 32 bits get expanded to 48 bits. In such a way that out of each group of four bits, the middle one just pass through and the outer ones get duplicated. So those get two positions and they interlock with the neighboring bits. And okay, then there's some funny lines from the outside because you can more think of this as being around the circle. So then, then this design is, is very, very regular. Okay, so at this point, we have done something to amplify our differences. So if the input bits, there was a difference of one, then if it was hitting one of those pieces which split into two bits, now we have two bits that are different. And otherwise, well, at least we're maintaining this one bit difference. Then we're XORing the key in there. So at that point, we're using 48 bits of the key. And as I said, this is not the key itself. This is a key 
with some modifications. You can find all the details in the specification of this. Now, so far everything has been linear, just well, duplicating or XORing, and now come the sequence of S boxes. So S box just means it's a substitution box. So this box will take a certain number of inputs, six in this case, and produce four output bits. And generally, some number. Sometimes it's the same number of output bits, and here it's actually compressing. It's taking six bits in and outputting four bits. So we've gone from 32 bits to 48, and now we're back to 32. Now the Ki is different for each round, but these substitution boxes and which bits they take on, so all the wiring is the same for any of these 16 rounds. And then there's another permutation. This is not the big outer permutation. This is just a permutation which also happens once in each round. Okay, so this is what's inside this function f. And then we have taken f on the right-hand side and we're adding this to the left-hand side. So I already mentioned that the expansion is help to, to amplify the differences, but also this compression function is, is moving things around. The substitution boxes are nonlinear. So if, you, if you're looking at some value x and you're adding the substitution box, whichever of these um, eight boxes that you're taking, um, for any SI, you have that the substitution box of x plus substitution of one is not the same as a substitution box at f x plus 1. That should be a plus 1 there. Um, you've done this in the exercises that you looked at, say, the all 0 input, and then the all 0 with the last bit being 1 input, and, well, then the 1 and the x plus 1 are the same. But also, if you're taking something with two ones or other things, you will not find anything where this linear property holds. And that means that if you have any differences, they don't just trace through. So you shouldn't learn any information from tracing through differences, except for, well, we'll get to something which is called differential group analysis, which is trying that. It is always possible. The question is simply, how hard is it? How many operations does it take? How much do you learn? And actually, the design of this was pretty good about that. However, at that point, no uh, rationale was given. These S-boxes were just saying, hip, here they are. And that was somewhat suspicious or highly suspicious because the uh, design that IBM submitted, this Lucifer design, had different S boxes. There was no justification given why they changed it, and it was pretty clear that it was the NSA rather than the National Standards Bureau, which was officially in charge of this. Now, 15 years later, Biham and Shamir developed its differential crypto analysis that I just mentioned, which is tracing differences through. And they found out that the desk S boxes, so the S boxes that the NSA had modified, were, were stronger than the original IBM ones. Now, a funny fact is that many Americans in particular see this as a reason why they would trust the NSA to be on the good side, because the NSA made the boxes stronger. Well, they didn't tell the research community, and it would have been a lot nicer if they had told the normal people, because then they could have developed better ciphers. But okay, there's secrecy and so on. But what they actually did was, yeah, okay, they made the S boxes a little bit stronger, but the key size is only 56 bits. And that was absolutely obviously too small. The IBM proposal that started from, that had 128 bits. That is a decent size for a block cipher. 56 bits is just not big enough. And that was already concerned back in 1976. So Diff and Hellman were raising an alarm about the key size, saying, hey, this can be broken by brute force for, okay, a pretty large budget, but nothing that would stop a nation state. And then 20-something years later, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, uh, built a device for a lot less than what Diff and Hellman were estimating because, well, technology had advanced a lot. And so they built a custom, customized design for 250,000 US dollars. And that actually managed to break some desk keys. However, that wasn't quite enough to stop desk. It took another seven years to have desk officially withdrawn. But it did speed up the transition. It did speed up 
uh, the search for better alternatives. So I have another slide talking about what other block ciphers there are. And so 2005, NIST, so that was the new uh, standardization body after the National Bureau of Standards got renamed into National Institutes for Standards Technology, so that's all the Americans. Um, they then said, okay, you shouldn't use DES anymore. Another year later, a uh, team at the Ruhr University in Bochum had a very nice presentation uh, on how to break DES for 8,980 euros. Um, there should have been a little footnote saying and a whole lot of uh, student time, but yes, the hardware that they built was um, using FPGAs, so those are um, programmable little devices which are comparably cheap and comparably powerful, and they fed a whole bunch of those into a PC enclosure and managed to break DES in less than a week on that thing. And that means one key every week, so if you have your list of, of favorite DES keys, you can get pretty far since 2006. Nevertheless, bad ideas never die, so DES is still around. Um, we see it most in the financial industry. And there the justification typically is that, okay, they invested some money, they have bought a um, hardware security module, so they have bought a little unit which holds their keys. These are really expensive. Those are self-certified. They would have to go through another round of certification if they rip this out. And look, nobody is really breaking it because nobody can get into this box. I don't think it's a particularly good excuse, but that is the, the typical answer you get. Now, somewhat good news is that when DES is used, it's typically used as triple DES. So that means it's not just one key of 56 bits, but it's three different keys. So the way that is then done for the encryption is that you first encrypt after on the first key, then you decrypt under the second key, and then you encrypt under the third key. Now the reason that there is this encrypt, decrypt, encrypt is that this engine would be backwards compatible with people who have a single DES by just setting all three keys to be the same. So you're first encrypting under the key K, then you're decrypting under this key. Well, it's done now, so the M, back to M, and then you're encrypting again under the same key. So if you have a single DES, you could use your triple DES engine with just having all three keys the same. Now you might think, okay, well, three times 56, that sounds like a lot to, to search through. Um, so is this now actually secure? Why shouldn't we just use triple DES? Now, one thing to notice is that when you're doing an attack, we typically assume that you have a pair of plain text and ciphertext. So somebody gives you this as an input and you should still have a hard time to break it. But in the case of DES, where it's three rounds, um, you can unravel this from both sides. So you can do, well, it's normally called meet in the middle, but here it's more like a meet two thirds of the way or it's a divide and conquer strategy. So you're trying to balance the workloads or to reduce multiple parts of the workload in going starting from both ends. It's a little bit of how mathematicians sometimes write a proof. You know where you start from, you know where you're going, and you hope that you find something in the middle. Well, here in particular, you start by saying, okay, I have that C is equal to this whole thing on M. Well, let's look, move the um, outer encryption, the encryption under K3, over to the other side. And then we test decrypt under all possible keys for that one, so I call this K3 bar. So I'm running through all 256 keys there, and I'm storing all this data. So I have one big table of 256, that's not impossible, that's storageable. And then I'm matching it up with the computation from the other side. So on the other side, I'm still left with two keys, namely K1 and K2. And so I'm running through all the combinations of two to the two times 56, so two to the 112 different keys split into K1 bar and K2 bar. And at some point, well, if it was a valid key pair, those two values have to match. So the time is a lot lower and there is some storage, but it's not a prohibitive amount of storage. So this attack means that DES doesn't have more than 112-bit security, even as triple DES. And if you have a two DES where you have, well, if it was just two of those, then you would do the same divide and conquer and actually meet in the middle with two to the 56 cost and storage. So that definitely would not be good. 
And even if you have a triple guess where the two outer keys are the same, um, there are some concerns about searches. So triple guess should be used with three different keys. I mentioned already that there was a new standard in the early 2000s, so NIST had been hosting a competition to find the new advanced encryption standard, AES. One requirement was that the block size should be 128 bits and that the keys should be at least 128 bits. Also, I think for the submission, the requirement was block size 128 bits and up, but what they eventually chose for standardization had then block size 128 bits. And so AES, before it was named this, was called Rheindau, which was uh, submitted by uh, Johan Dahmen, who is now in Nijmegen, and Vincent Reimann, who is in Berlin. AES is not a Pistol cipher, so the structure that we've seen on the, on the previous slides is not being used there. It was the basis of many of the older designs because it was a well understood design, but nowadays we understand more of those, so AES is based on um, on a different way of thinking things. It's again based on fermentation and the latest approach also by Darman and collaborators is using sponges. And um, if you want to learn more about this, do some searches. We're not going to cover more of the details on these. But the good news is that after 40 years of public research, we have a lot more theory to build good block sizes. We also sometimes look for cheaper functions and then DES, well, cheaper functions in hardware, and then DES is actually good inspiration. So the present lightweight cipher um, is using some S boxes from DES. So it has these um, 6 bits to 4 bits design, and it was looking for those with optimal characters against differential tags. And yes, relax, it uses a, a much bigger key, so it has 80 bit keys, which is still not a range that I'm happy with but it's something that is standard for lightweight ciphers. So short summary, um, a block cipher is always using or encrypting the data in blocks of bits. And we're having a whole bunch of good ones. For this course, we're going in detail through DES. If you stay on for the master's track, you'll see AES. And well, if you ever need to use a block cipher, AES or anything recent are decent choices. Thank you for your attention.